One of the most famous civilizations in world history is, without doubt, the Greek city-states, providing the world with some of its most rich and developed culture at that time. Even today, the Greeks are studied for their relatively advanced society despite the time. Welcome to History Simplified. And today we'll be presenting you with the rise of the ancient Greek civilization. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and to turn notifications on for more videos like today. Without further ado, let's begin. Greek has been repeatedly described as a fallen and yet somehow immortal society because of its incredible cultural impact, most of which is still felt today. Through most of its history, Greece was poor. In the classical era, though, Greece was incredibly populated and very urbanized. Many surprisingly healthy Greeks lived in remarkably big houses and worked for high wages at specialized occupations. Middle class spending drove sustained economic growth and classical wealth producing a stunning cultural effervescence lasting hundreds of years. However, Greeks' height was only reached during the classical period. Despite experiencing what was once known as the Greek miracle, they were defeated and their glory brought to an abrupt end. When we're talking of ancient Greece, we're actually referring to two very broad and important periods in the history of this country. First, we have the Classical Age, from 480 to 323 BC, and then we have the years 700 to 480 before Christ. These were mostly known for its art, architecture, and philosophy. Archaic Greek was advanced in art, poetry, and technology, but it's mostly known for the age in which the city-state or polis was invented. Greece could be more accurately described as a constellation of ancient cultures precisely due to the city-state system. Yes, Greece wasn't just a place. It was actually several intertwined cultures under the same banner, though all of them had their own ruling system and politics between each other. Concepts such as colonialism, democracy, and military strategy can be traced back to origins in early Greek history. In this timeline, we'll mark the rise of Greece from its proliterate beginnings to its decline and eventual fall to Rome's superior forces more than 2100 years ago. Greece is one of the four pillars of important civilizations to have influenced Western societies, and its main traits can also be highlighted in its contemporary societies, such as the Romans, the Sumerians of Mesopotamia, and the Egyptian dynasties. All of these civilizations established laws, revered one or many gods, created voting rights for citizens, advanced science, and put the expressive arts above all things. We look back to these ancient societies and recognize the seeds and sprouts that flourished in the following cultures. The Greek inhabitants were called Hellas. The reason why the silly states were created was because during what was called the Greek Dark Ages before the Archaic period, people inhabited throughout Greece and nothing more than small farming villages. These villages grew larger and thus they also began to evolve. Some of them built walls, though most built what was known as Agora or Marketplace. The Agora was more than just a place to buy and sell or set up shop. It was a community meeting place where people interacted. People developed governments and also organized their citizens according to some sort of constitution or set of laws. They also raised armies and set up a tax collection system. Each of these polis was said to be protected by a particular god or goddess to whom the citizens of the polis owed reverence, respect, and sacrifice. For example, Athens' deity was Athena, and so was Spartus. Next we had Corinth, Thebes, and Delphi. One of the most important breakthroughs in the history of Greece is how they developed their own writing style. It's a still undeciphered script called Linear A, which also appears in historical record. Around 1500 BCE, another familiar looking form known as Linear B emerges as a writing style, being recognizable enough on a precursor to the Greek language. It has also been translated and provides some insights into Greek life before more advanced settlements evolved. Around that year, prosperous tradesmen began developing each of the agoras and establishing complex settlements among their towns. Some islands in the Agion Sea and port cities became sites of comfortable dwelling with many signs of luxury. The city of Massene was the most prosperous one, with wealth being concentrated in the hands of only a few of the richest men there. The privileged group of high class of the time included kings, merchants, and the priests that kept the temples running, which is not very different from what happens today. Mycena became both a trading and military power and by 1300 BCE is the dominant power of the Agion. Its wealth and influence are such that this era, from approximately 1600 to 1100 BCE, is called the Mycenaean period of Greek history. Next up, Knossos becomes a successful trading village. Knossos is located on the island of Crete, and despite being assaulted by several natural disasters, like earthquakes and invasions, the city is wealthy enough to erect an even more impressive temple on the site of the original. 
Merchants proceed to extend trade routes further west to Iberia and also north into the interior of modern-day Europe. Unsurprisingly, Mycenae's power and prosperity is envied by its neighbors from the Hellas and from abroad too. Mycenae was attacked in the 12th century BCE by several waves of invaders, historically regarded as nothing more than sea people, though they were most likely coastal Anatolians. They were also followed by their internal rivals, the Dorians, and also hit by an earthquake. Wow! Quick fun and interesting fact, the reason why there are so many earthquakes in Greece is because the northern Aegean Sea and mainland Greece both rest on active fault lines that have, across several millennia, caused tens of thousands of tremors and quakes. There's also evidence that Greeks might have considered earthquake-scarred zones as blessed by the gods. They've also repeatedly rebuilt the same spots where earthquakes destroyed important structures. Athens, which is an ally of Mycenae, escaped destruction around the time, and by 900 BCE, it increased in influence by encouraging non-Dorian Greeks to colonize the surrounding cities. Even the wealthy and powerful Mycenae were unable to endure a combination of so many external and internal factors. Eventually, Athens took the center stage, with its power and cultural influence massively increasing in the 9th and 8th centuries BCE. It also sponsored the first ever Olympic Games in 776 BCE, and during the same decade, Homer's landmark epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were written. That's essentially a landmark moment for humanity in general. During this time, Athenian government officials were elected by fellow citizens rather than appointed. This is how the first democracy was also created. Its citizens accumulated wealth and formed many dynasties to pass from generation to generations, creating the concept of inheritance. It just seems like the Greeks had a knack for inventing stuff before anyone else had the idea of doing the same. However, at the same time, Sparta, another Dorian city-state, became the first class military power in the area. By the middle of the 7th century BCE, the importance and power of Athens was challenged by it. While Athens was known for its support of arts and culture, Sparta was a very different and aggressive type of fish. The ruling class of Sparta viewed itself as non-citizens of their lands, but instead as marauders who invaded the Dorian region and took it over to enslave the native inhabitants, whom they unceremoniously labeled as helots. While Athenians were no strangers to the concept of slavery, they never reached the inhumane numbers as Spartans did. Spartans became wealthy by basically living on the backs of the helots, who outnumbered them ten to one. Spartans were on guard against the possibility of a slave rebellion at any time. Spartans' culture, as movies had made a bit infamous, was definitely different from Athenian culture. All Spartan men are radically required to defend their city-state, and their military prowess became second to none. The rivalry and divergent cultures continued for centuries to the point of exaggeration by the films and movies that came a couple centuries afterwards. As we mentioned, the first concept of a democracy was born in Athens, but its seeds were planted during the previous periods, which is what allowed them to sprout into one of the most important concepts in politics and social science. In 594 BCE, Solon became an archon, which is a magistrate in Greek of Athens. Solon also instituted some big changes in Athenian society. First, all debts were cancelled for the peasants of Attica. It also made it legal to enslave debtors, and citizens were now all entitled to participate in the ecclesia, the body that elects archons. Moving forward and near the end of the century, in 508 BCE, a new Athenian ruler known as Cleithians effected a big political reform. Now every citizen got their own voice in the demos, which is the local council in towns and villages. Athens also became more intellectually advanced. Schools were formed for the children of citizens, and even a job description was created. Philosophers were now some of the most important men in society. These important political and social advancements were essential for Athens to remain as the main city-state of ancient Greece. However, things were not going to bode well forever for the Greeks. Roughly in the beginning of the mid-16th century BCE, Persia arrived from the east, causing many skirmishes and full-scale wars with the Greek city-states and bringing more trouble with them. To resist the Persians, even cultures as absolute opposite as Spartan Athens came together to form a fragile alliance. Though they aren't actual allies and probably wouldn't remain as such, even after things were over, the threat posed by the Persians was much bigger than their internal pettiness, and they were determined to stay united for the course of the conflicts until things were sorted out. Persia was Greece's most determined and pesky adversary, fighting them for 100 years to seize control of the Athenian colony of Ionia, which is present-day Turkey and also attacking the Greek mainland in both 490 and 481 BCE. However, the Greeks were able to repel them with both victories on the sea and the land, and even pushed them back to Asia. Much death and destruction followed suit until 448 BCE when Persia agreed to a peace treaty and ended conflicts on all fronts. 
Then a man named Percules was born, an Athenian noble. He wasn't totally on board with Athens' pact with Sparta, seeing them more as an adversary than an ally. And was bound to happen, the Helots rebelled against their Spartan masters. Athens had lent them a hand and sent a force to assist Sparta, and Sparta outright refused the aid and told them they'd handle the matter themselves. Pericles was completely skeptical of Sparta's intentions and also introduced far-reaching democratic reforms in Athens. He allowed all Athenian citizens to vote and to participate in the administration of the state. This brings greater equality and civic involvement to the citizens. A peace treaty with Sparta was signed and things were going smooth for a few years. Until once more, Sparta decided that it needed to be the most powerful city-state and eventually Athens surrendered to Sparta in 404 BCE. However, they spared Athens due to their service to its fellow city-states and their common enemies. Despite being taken over by Sparta, Athens remained a center for education, literature, drama, science, philosophy, and many other paths of education and discovery. So how did Greece fall? It's a combination of things. First, Macedon, and then Rome. Macedon, a city-state, gave birth to Alexander the Great. Macedon became the greatest city-state by finally destroying Persia and destroying the greater palace of Xerxes at around 330 BCE. Athens lost much of its power with the rise of Macedon. Meanwhile, in the west, Rome expanded what is now known as the Italian Peninsula and Sicily. With the Greeks at their weakest, Rome managed to easily conquer Macedon and the other Greek city-states, though it decreed that Greece is free as long as it remained under Roman protection. The final nail to Greece's coffin was the destruction of Carthage, an outpost of Greek influence and the main successor to Macedon's and Athens' power. Once it was sacked by the Romans, Greece was essentially taken over by the Romans, and thus, it fell to them. So what are your thoughts on the rise and fall of the ancient Greek civilization? Let us know in the comments below. Also make sure to leave us a like, share this video with your friends, and finally subscribe to History Simplified for more videos like today. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time for more.